Welcome to the Moms Making Six Figures podcast, where it's all about real women, real stories, real inspiration. And now your host and creator of Moms Making Six Figures, Heidi Bartolotta. So Miriam, thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview with me. We're thrilled to have you on the podcast. I'm uh, just humbled that I was selected to be a part of this platform and to share my professional journey and through that impact women in business. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Let's start with that. Let's start with your journey. Maybe go back and kind of take us through that and talk me through your journey in your life and in your career. Um, Yeah, Uh, you know, uh, like many, uh, maybe I didn't have the best uh, childhood uh, living in uh, a country that at that time was going through a change in regime and ultimately becoming, um, you know, a a religious led country, uh, nationality and Persian. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, coming to the U.S., uh, dealing with that culture shock temporarily but also coming to the U.S. knowing that um, my parents were now going to be separated permanently and that overnight my mom was going to be a single mom with two children. And uh, I was eight and my brother was three. And uh, we came to the U.S. to really be able to have the opportunities that wasn't going to be uh, available back in Iran and to live the American dream. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom, I think, has been the biggest driving force of who I am today and maybe what I continue to, to strive to be. Um, even though I'm a, a woman who's 46 years old and has three uh, teenage grown children of my own, um, she is my compass and a reminder of we went through hardship. And uh, in order to do that, uh, we have to be the best that we could be. And who have we impacted along the way? And what an example. I mean, leaving your home country is not an easy thing. Right. Yeah. And she was an educated woman. She had her MBA degree, but she had not worked. And uh, when she came here, she didn't have an inheritance or anything of that. So literally it was $1,000 and two kids. And that is going to only last so long you know, heavy accent, couldn't really speak English that well, uh, different culture. And her Mm -hmm. first job was uh, flipping burgers and Jack in a Box double shift. And we moved to the the ghetto hood, you know, part of LA where you you better be street smart, you better be tough, you know, you better be strong. And she was working double shift and I was eight and she said, you know, Miriam, I need you. I know you're only eight, but I need to lean on you and I need you to help me raise your brother. And I need you guys, you need, you need to watch out for him. So I could go out there and work two jobs and come back and for us to be able to um, make it. Mm -hmm. But this was a woman who till this day still never talks about the past. She is always someone who just wants to think about the future. And um, the goal was that Uh, we have an opportunity, man or woman, to be whatever we want to be. And that closed mouths don't get fed. And no one's going to want success for you more than you want it yourself. And we see this every day that most people are living with that victim mentality or they're too quick to point the finger at someone else or who stood in their way of what they wanted to accomplish. So I saw the power of work ethic and... Six months later, it went to entry-level accounting, then it went to controller, CPA, and eventually CFO for multiple companies. She also believed that if someone's not going to appreciate you, then someone else will. So with women, just being in business for over 25 years myself, sometimes being loyal to a fault, Mm -hmm. knowing that time is going against you or waiting to be promoted. So you cannot add value to others if you don't see that value within yourself. 
And so um, I started working at age 15 and a half and I've never not stopped working. And I don't care what kind of financial status or success my significant other might have. I'm looking in the mirror. I think even if he was a billionaire, I would still be working. I would actually have depression if I stay at home all day long. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, who are we impacting other than our immediate family? I think all of us come with a certain gift. What are we passionate about? What is our purpose? What is that greater purpose? And so at 15 and a half, I, you know, was selling uh, jewelry and then shoes and then waitressing. And then at 18 to 23, I went into banking because now I wanted to dress professional, deal with people that make money, have money and pick their brain, find out what they're doing. And my mom was strict. She said, if you want nice things, which I always liked nice things, I don't want to hear, we can't afford to go there. We can't afford that house. We can't afford that car. Or Miriam, you need to wait to September for your birthday to get that gift. Mm -hmm. I don't understand that. And therefore, uh, what are you going to do in order to provide those things for your life as well? And so that led into... Um, you know, me working 25 hours a week and going to school. Mm -hmm. And I say this to my children as well. Being book smart is not enough. You could have four PhDs and have a personality of a fish. It's a combination of being street smart and book smart. Being street smart, knowing how to make money, being fearless, being a calculated risk taker. But at the same time, when you're making money, how are you protecting it, preserving it, and growing it? Knowing we live in a country that so many people that are turning 65 and up are struggling financially. Yes. And that living, uh, you know, we're living longer and leaning on our children, you know, is, can't really be an option. So um, this led to me finishing my bachelor in business marketing at age 23 and immediately going into a Fortune 500 organization. Um, I knew that I want to position myself, even if it's entry level within big organizations and mm -hmm. move up from there. And this is at a time where people were afraid of a hundred percent commission business. I mean, everybody was looking for that salary. Everyone was, you know, comfortable with being told what they were worth mm -hmm. and, uh, what dictated your income was going to be your age, your gender, your experience. And being a 23-year-old female, you knew I was probably going to be overworked and underpaid. Mm -hmm. But I had a, an opportunity to work for beautiful, uh, amazing companies that became eventually the backbone for what allowed me to succeed in the financial insurance industry at that time. So I was a headhunter uh, for Robert Half International. Uh, recruiting, um, interviewing people, placing them in certain positions, running and getting these new accounts. Um, and then later on was Lucent Technologies, which was business to business phone sales. Mm -hmm. And here now, I, you know, personality wise, to get the best out of me, put me in a position where I can transfer that knowledge, where I can develop others. And my goal is to always have that person achieve faster success than I ever did. Mm -hmm. And um, no matter what my competition might be, I'll give away my secret sauce. I don't feel that just because I'm sharing my best practices that I might be hurting my own chances of growth. You know, look, you know with, the, with the population we have just in San Diego, not alone the, the US, yes. <laughs> there's plenty of people to prospect. Mm -hmm. So at this time, I was tired of, again, being told what I was worth. When I was in my early 20s, my goal was to be the VP of marketing. And back then, they were all men. Yeah. And there were men that were in their mid-50s. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, my God, when am I ever going to have that opportunity? And so um, I thought more education means more income. And at the same token, back then, more education meant upward mobility. Right. So while I was now pregnant with my second child, because I got married to my husband a week before my 22nd birthday, 
Uh, we met in a concert when I was 19 and he was 24 and we dated for almost three years and fell in love and got married. I grew up early. Sometimes I think, why was I so ready for marriage and children? And I think it's because I had this big responsibility from very early yeah. on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, knock on wood, it's, it's been 25 years of, of a beautiful marriage. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I know I'm going back and forth a lot and I'm trying to make sure I stay on pace, but I ended up then finishing my master's in education. And it wasn't because I wanted to be a teacher in a classroom. It was because I wanted to educate people through the process. Interesting. Naturally, I am a very impatient person. And naturally, I might uh, not be a great listener. Or I uh, maybe can't understand why someone doesn't want it as bad as I want it, or why is it taking them longer? Now, I'm going back into my 20s and early 30s. Mm -hmm. So I thought the master's in education will allow me to understand people more, to understand different learning styles, mm -hmm. and to force myself to be more patient and to learn how to educate people through a process. And once I did that, the most income I was making now was 45,000 a year with all this ball of energy. And so we were living in, should I continue with yeah. this? Yeah, talk about, let's talk about Las Vegas. So you were living in Las Vegas. Yes. Talk so, about your career there because that's what led you to San Diego. Yes, so we were, you know, we had moved to Vegas because that was the hottest place in dentistry. It was mm -hmm. before dental school, all that. Young dentists were making $300,000 a year. Mm -hmm. We didn't have kids. We moved there. And I said, honey, I don't want to raise kids there. I don't want to live there. That's a place to go party and come back to reality. Mm -hmm. He said, Miriam, your bachelor's in business marketing. You could work anywhere. Let's go. Three years. I have a $300,000 loan. I'll pay it off. I'll move you back to California. Because I was a California girl. I was raised in LA and then the Bay Area. Three years ended up becoming 12 years and three children. But prior to that, now the girls were one and four, and I'm a teacher in that classroom. And I'm telling my husband, you know what? The kids are now one and four, and the four-year-old now can see some billboards, or I'm teaching in a private school, and, you know, I see what, you know, right. some of those careers are, and I don't want to live here. And it's 115 degree, et cetera. And he said, Miriam, I have two practices. I'm making $300,000 a year. You're a teacher who's making $45,000 a year. Where do you wanna, where do you wanna live? I said, I wanna live in San Diego. Because my brother was born in San Diego, by the way. Because we had come back and forth several times until we permanently came here. And I said, or Laguna. He goes, I have to pay state taxes. It's more <laughs> expensive to live there. We don't have any friends or family there. I would have to walk away from these two practices and come and start from scratch. Mm -hmm. And if we're living in this, you know, 6,000 square foot home that has seven bathrooms, you're not going to be getting that in Vegas. I mean, in um, San Diego. I said, I don't want the, the bathrooms and the, and the luxury life. I want a nice life, but that's not what's going to keep me here. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, why don't we make a deal? Why don't we make a deal? Honestly, Miriam, if you want to move there, I need to be able to lean on you financially. So if you could match my income, I will move wherever you say. And inside, I'm like, my God, the most I've ever made was 45,000. And, and back then, when you heard someone is making even 100,000, it was like a big deal. Mm -hmm. Now we know 100,000 after taxes and, and investment and uh, living expense is really 40,000 a year. <laughs> it, yeah, we could talk about that yeah. later. But I said, um, how am I gonna make 300? Oh my goodness, definitely not gonna be selling drugs. And then at this point, um, I thought, okay, you know what? Insurance or real estate? Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, which one? And again, this is before I know everything I know now, but back then, a 29-year-old kid, I said, okay, real estate, my income is fluctuated by the dictation of the market. There is no residual income. Insurance, no matter what's going on in the economy, is recession-proof. And you have residual income. And plus, 
my brother was in that industry and um, you know, I saw how successful he was at a young age because he went straight into that industry. And I said, I'm gonna give it a chance. So I went in there with this strong personality and I sat with the branch manager and I said, here's my degrees, here's my background and I like a position in leadership. And he called me Habashi. And he said, Habashi, uh, have you ever worked 100% commission? I said, no. He said, have you ever sold insurance? I said, no, I just got licensed last week. He said, then I can't put you in a leadership role. No one's gonna respect you. You need to know what they're going through in the field. You need to know how hard it is. You need to know, you know what things might you know, need to change or tweak in order for these people to find better success. Mm -hmm. And plus, we've had plenty of people that on resume looked wonderful or even know how to speak you know, eloquently or dress nice, but then they come in here and they can't even you know, rub two nickels together. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna start as an agent in the field and then if you make X amount of dollars in six months, um, I will move you to entry level management. I said, okay. And I came home and my husband said, so what are you gonna do? I said, I've joined this Fortune 500 publicly traded company, Bankers Life. He goes, well, what's your base? I said, nothing. <laughs> he said, okay, okay, so what's, what's the benefits? I said, nothing. He said, are you okay? <laughs> I said, but they told me that the more people I help to get what they want, the more people I could truly protect and educate, well, the more income I'm gonna make plus my bonuses. And no one's gonna dictate my growth. I can work seven days a week. I could work night, I could work day. And um, personality wise, I'm very self-disciplined mm -hmm. and um, I'm extremely competitive and uh, yeah, I don't need someone to dangle a carrot or to motivate me. Right. And so I was going to make it happen. Plus, I had this sense of urgency to, to, to leave right. Vegas as soon as possible. And prove something to your husband, it sounds like, too. Yeah. Yeah. To my, no, <laughs> prove something to me. Yeah. Prove something to me. Uh, you know, can I do this, mm -hmm. really? You know, um, and then through that, hopefully say, hey, I did it. Right. You know, let's do it. And at 29, I joined the industry making 300 phone calls a day till you hear my voice is hoarse. I have a couple of nodules probably on my vocal cords, plus I'm a talker. And uh, knocking on doors till your knuckle hurt, 115 degree, your makeup is melting, your foot's on, sole of your shoe is on fire, and you know, being five feet tall, wearing these heels. Um, but when I had an opportunity to sit down and educate people and review their policies or help protect that house, in case, you know, there's a death, there's an illness. Mm -hmm. It just, I loved it. I was passionate about it. And by the time I was 35, I went from field trainer to sales supervisor to assistant branch manager to um, eventually branch manager. So by the time I was 35, I was taking home 300,000 a year. And I had um, 45 people in my team in Vegas. I recruited you if you were a waiter, a waitress, a bouncer. Uh, um, if I thought I could put you in a better place, mm -hmm. personally, professionally, financially, and introduce you to this world where you can help people with things like finances, um, then let's do it. Uh, as long as you're what I call a fat PhD, flexible, adaptable, trainable, professional, hungry, and driven for success, which I still use that today, by the way. And then that was it. The company said, Miriam, uh, uh, at that point, my branch manager uh, wanted to move back to Sacramento. And he said, Miriam, if you want, you can take over the Vegas offices. We had two. And I said, no, you know I've worked my tail off to, to leave. You know, help me transition into either Laguna or San Diego. Mm -hmm. And in 2009, I got the opportunity to come and run their branch, their one branch in San Diego and take it somewhere because it had not gone anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I called my husband and I said, let's go. We're packing our bags. And he's like, what? Wait, let's talk. No, how about I come part time? You go. I said, no, you promised. And he was awesome and he trusted me. And he walked away from these two practices because his brother was a dentist as well. So it's not like he was able to sell or cash out. 
So he walked away. And it was now a surprise pregnancy in that five years, which was my son. So I would work all the way to the day before I gave birth or I went back to work only a month after because I have a team of people that are commission driven. Mm -hmm. So nothing kept me down. Pregnancy, motherhood, wife, you, you, you could do it all. If you really want to, you can do it all. Is it, is it easy to become successful? No, it's not. Mm -hmm. That's why only 9% of, of the population in the United States make six figures and 1% make seven. Mm -hmm. It's not easy, but can it be done with the right work ethic system and process and mindset? Yes, mm -hmm. for any of us. So at that point, we came here in 2009 and I opened up the first office. When that became a million dollar operation, the second office, when that became a million, the third office, then the fourth office, and eventually, um, I had a driver that would drive me to the Laguna location so I could work uh, instead of being stuck in traffic. And I had 120 agents now wow. in the team. And a lot of people throw numbers at this many people, but mm -hmm. it's about how many producers, not how many bodies. Right. So we had 120 uh, producers in the team, and uh, I became the first female regional director after 134 years. Wow. So we did not have a woman in that role in over a century for this company. And I was just blessed and honored that and they worked. I worked hard. I did. I earned it, which is one of the reasons I became the co-founder for the WLNC, the Women's Learning Network Committee, with the help of the CEO. It's because my pet peeve is when someone's going to be put in a role because of their culture, their ethnicity, their gender. This is a production-driven business. I don't care if you're a man, a woman, or an it. And therefore, being uh, creating this committee with other talented individuals allowed us to develop women to have greater confidence, to have solid systems and process in order to recruit, retain, and produce. Mm -hmm. And then um, had an opportunity again to speak on the same uh, platform that John Maxwell had spoken. He's my idol. He's my, he's amazing. Yeah, and amazing. Um, yeah. And in 2014, that led to a, a brilliant lady that I met. And I became a co-author of a book called Pure Wealth. And in chapter one, we have 26 authors, 26 chapters. And in chapter uh, one, I talk about what it takes to win, which is the why. Mm -hmm. You know, another brilliant uh, gentleman, thought leader is Simon Sinek. And Simon Sinek mm -hmm. talks about the why. Mm -hmm. And then um, everything was amazing and great. And I got recruited out to go represent a Fortune 100. And they were not going to ask me to travel as much as I was traveling. And they were, for the first time, were going to offer me uh, to not be 100% commission, only for uh, a five-year contract, which was way more than what I was earning at that time, which was still a lot. And um, in San Diego, and to be the president and CEO of my own brokerage firm, representing. So it was upward mobility in all ways. And so I uh, left that company, um, and I made sure that I didn't bite the hand that fed me. <laughs> I did not recruit people out. I wanted that legacy to carry on. Mm -hmm. I wanted to leave with a good reputation. And I went solo to start from scratch. Did that for a few years, and I felt that I wasn't happy, and I felt that um, unfulfilled. And one of the reasons was that with this amazing Fortune 100 company, I was alone in the West Coast. It was an East Coast company. And it was more like to each their own, mm -hmm. as long as you're being compliant. There wasn't these weekly calls or monthly calls to, to share ideas or, or hold there each no other. Collaboration. You know, yeah. And again, if I'm not impacting a greater good, I don't feel fulfilled. I want to impact more than just my inner circle. Mm -hmm. And this company made the decision eventually to pull out of the West Coast. They just saw that the West Coast is just ridiculously expensive to have a physical shop. 
Mm-hmm. I think they were paying 15000 a month for my rent just for that office in La Jolla. Mm-hmm. And that they wanted to just have people working from home representing the West Coast. So it was in a way that had I not left that company to go to this one, and had this company not decided to pull out of the West Coast, I would have not gotten to the point where I was going to take the next biggest risk in my professional journey. I probably would have been in that business forever. Right. If you asked me several years ago, would you see yourself being the founder of Infuse Theory, a business coaching platform? I would have been like, what are you talking about? I actually went to that company in hopes of being maybe eventually a female CEO for that company when the existing one was to maybe retire Mm -hmm. for greater upward mobility. And so um, it was devastating when they decided to close that office. And oh my God, I remember just even though um, I was financially very well taken care of, Mm -hmm. I remember, and I don't cry, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but my mother always said, you know, cry for something that you have, you cannot have control over. Don't cry for something you could fix. Mm -hmm. But I remember just hysterically just going crazy and saying that what what am I going to do who am I where am I going to work like insurance investment is all I know and I did not want to start from scratch again it that was f- almost 14 15 years of building an empire right and I went to six different interviews and everyone's like Miriam you're amazing but we're going to start from scratch we're going to start from the beginning one company said I'll give you 100 one said I'll give you 200 but I had to start from scratch. And now I was worried. Mm-hmm. Well, how about if, you know, the rug is taken out under me again? Mm-hmm. And I'd never gone through that before because in the world I came from, top producers are always safe. Mm-hmm. And uh, moving to Philly was not going to happen. <laughs> I, by this time, my husband had at that time three locations here in, in San Diego. Today, he has five dental practices here, but at that time, he had three. And I wasn't going to move this man everywhere I go. Mm-hmm. So I took a year and I decided I'm going to open up my own business coaching development platform because it is male dominated. Mm-hmm. And someone said, Well, why don't you be a coach for just women? I said, No. I want to be a coach for anybody Mm -hmm. because what I have to offer is actually going to help everybody. And I could be wrong on this. Here's what I think about um, when we are only coaching women. Okay. At the end of the day, if men are still the majority drivers and the the presidents and the CEOs and the VPs of these larger organizations, and all you want to do is concentrate on helping the women, You can't do that without also impacting the men so the women have the opportunity to grow. So either you got to impact both Mm -hmm. or I think not at all to some degree because they're still going to hit that ceiling. Mm -hmm. So I came up with infuse theory and infuse is inject. I'm going to infuse these best practices and knowledge is not power. The application of knowledge is power. So these are theories that if you don't do anything about it, nothing's going to happen. But if you put it into play, you will have guaranteed explosive growth. I didn't do it for growth. I did it for explosive growth. How long have you had it now? We are now going in by the time it was created and now into effect. It's only been about three years um, going on four. I want to ask you a question about yeah. that. So one of the things that I've seen over and over again in the very successful women that I have had the pleasure of interviewing is there is always something, which for you was the company pulling out of the West Coast, that flips your life in a way that you didn't expect or want, that ends up changing your trajectory. And almost all the time, they're so thrilled with where their life went because of that. But in the moment, it was it's dark. Dark, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So will you talk about that? Because I think it's such an interesting... Absolutely. Yeah. And um, what's amazing is in that one year, I put my head down. I, I think for the first few months, I was just going through my emotions. hmm you know, trying to figure out why it happened, Mm -hmm. looking for a sign. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Why? Just tell me, why did it happen? Or where am I going? Just, just very unknown as it, how did this happen? Which was a shock. And then where am I going next? Mm -hmm. And that I had plans. <laughs> and, um, but after four months passed, I said, Miriam, you're not going to get the answer. There is no crystal ball. It is what it is. And all you need to, all you have, all you can do is go forward, which is another thing I talk about. Direction is always more important than position. So all I have is to go forward. And what are you ultimately passionate about? Was it actually the insurance product? No, it was recruiting, developing, problem solving, um, giving you another best practice, developing leaders, which I was great at. Mm -hmm. You know, agents till this day, my first recruit is still with the other company making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year now mm -hmm. and a leader in that organization or other people, men and women that I had an opportunity to work with. So developing six figure earners that, um, and money is not the number one thing that motivates me though. It might come across like that in this interview. Money is the end result. Money is profit. Yes. Money comes and goes. And it provides a lot of options. It provides a lot of options, but if we lead with passion and purpose, mm -hmm. then ultimately we will generate the income that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And for me, every day is the way, the way I do my personal goal setting is, okay, how many, how many people do I want to impact every month? And then, okay, then what is that going to equal in, 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 you know, mm -hmm. dollar amount and, and other things, but it's always about how many people I'm going to meet or impact, mm -hmm. whether they join my coaching platform or not. Mm -hmm. So some people, uh, I'm a big, uh, part of uh, BNI, which is throughout the, the U S yes. and I think globally, uh, business network international. And with BNI, it really talks about having the givers gain mentality yeah. that if you're giving, don't expect to receive because that's how now you set yourself up for disappointment. Mm -hmm. Maybe you give more than you receive. But if you're giving and you're helping, sooner or later, you will be able to, to feed off of that relationship mm -hmm. and in turn help your business or your family. Mm -hmm. So I was going through really, really dark times. And I think what I, what I decided to do was just start to now build something okay, honey, I'm going to open up my own business coaching company. And he goes, what? He goes, do people really even need that? Do they, do they, you know, he goes, are they going to invest in that? Are they going to pay for that? I said, well, they should. I think every person should have a business development coach. My clients right now, I coach about 50 students a week right now throughout the U S and Canada. Mm -hmm. I have students that are making three, 400,000 and, and are stuck and now want to go to that next level. And I have students that are struggling. I have students that are actually in the process of getting some sort of license. So no matter where we are, two heads work better than one. And I actually even think hiring a coach that's not in your own industry is a plus because they're coming with a different perspective. They're coming with an out of the box thinking. Mm -hmm. So if you're a realtor and you have only a real estate coach, sure, that's wonderful. But in some way, you're also crippling that growth and the bigger picture that you could be looking at. So my clientele are real estate, insurance, investment, small business owner, artist, muralist, dentist, brand photographer, um, solar, yeah. roofing. Um, also because sales is sales and leadership is leadership. It's just about the product, just, mm -hmm. the, just the product's different. Well, and one of the things that I find in coaching is that it's, it's in their head. It's for a lot of, for a lot of people, what a coach does is it allows them to see their blind spots and the things that they can improve on and do better in order to grow. Right. And I think that one of the things that I so appreciate about great coaches is to your point, I don't think they have to be from your industry because a lot of times those blind spots are better seen by someone else that is not in your industry. So yeah, I agree with you. And a powerful coach can change your life. 
I mean, change your life. So yes, and, yeah. and that's the goal. With me, it's about giving you transferable skills, mm -hmm. so tangible skills, mm -hmm. uh, a blueprint. I'm not your accountability coach. How many dollars did you make? How many people did you call? How many did you close? I'm going to teach you how to become self-disciplined, mm -hmm. self-accountable, and have this exterior systems and processes that are driving you towards your daily goals. Yeah. And, and, and I don't believe in annual goals. They don't come true. Mm -hmm. So the concept of that 12-week year, breaking it into quarterly, then breaking it into monthly, and then breaking it into daily activities. But going back to um, the dark times, I had no choice but to go forward. And I had no idea um, where this is going to go. But I knew this is what is going to make me happy. And it's the only way I can justify starting from scratch with zero. Don't with you, zero. Don't you think, though, that you're, again, going back to the way that you started, is your mom really taught you like starting over is can be very powerful right yes. I mean truly she she modeled that for you so yes. yeah she is definitely uh, more fearless than I am I mean her story she 16 years ago she quit as a CFO and she opens up her own property management company in San Francisco and she was renting a penthouse and um, Azari Property Management. Her last name is Azari. And the property management company becomes, you know, starts thriving. She rents a building. She uh, buys the building. She sells the building. She gets a CBS. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and then she opens up a second company, which becomes real estate, and a third company, which becomes contractor license and construction. And at 65, her fourth company, which becomes staging. And if you ask Siri, who's the number one property management company in the Bay Area, she'll tell you it's my mother's mother. company. Yeah. And she becomes, and as she makes income, she starts buying properties, renting or buying properties and fixing and selling. And uh, today she is a self-made millionaire. Yeah, that's awesome. She is. What and an incredible story. Yes, it's yeah. it's it's uh, um, thank you to whoever <laughs> is 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 watching out for us and and I also think about that as well, and I and I think that um, I'm not a religious person. I I believe in God and I believe in the, our commandments. Right. Mm -hmm. I believe that when you do good, good things will come your way, mm -hmm. and when you do bad, bad things will get you, and so. Do good, give, take care of people, have a good heart, have their best interest. Don't lie, steal, or cheat because you can. Um, under promise, over deliver. And hopefully through that, you could get whatever it is that you're hoping to achieve. So one of the questions that I always ask is, books or podcasts, and we have this you know, listener base that most of them are aspiring to six figures, so they want to be where you are. What would you recommend? Is there one book, maybe one, <laughs> or a podcast? So books or podcasts, I, I think you would expect me to say this as a, as a certified DISC coach. <laughs> it depends on your learning style. Some people need to hear. They mm -hmm. need to listen. Some people need to read the words. Mm -hmm. So one is not better than the other. It's what gets through you. That's that. My favorite book, one of my favorite books is by Jim Collins. It's a red book called Good to Great. Yes. I uh, love that book. So uh, when I read, it's usually leadership books and, and, and things that will teach me best practices, but also allow me to um, work on my blind spots. I think, um, you know, all of us have strengths and all of us have weaknesses and all of us have areas of improvement. And I... I'm very aware of mine, and I've done my best in the last probably five to 10 years to work on those. And I see that. I see that transformation with the way I led 10, 20 years ago versus the way I lead today. And, and with, with DISC, it's about the uh, golden rule is 
treat people the way you want to be treated. This says, no, it's not. It's the platinum rule. Treat people the way they want to be treated. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we, we can't read our, our label if we're in, that in the jar. So I think it's been an eye-opening experience for me to say, okay, this is why everybody communicates, but not everybody connects. And this is how you're being perceived, or this is, you know, how you could maybe adapt in order to better connect with people. Yeah. So I, I still work on that and I catch myself. Self-talk is huge. You need to sell yourself to yourself every day, but you also be, need to be honest mm -hmm. and self-talk to things that you would do differently next time to have a more favorable outcome. Um, whether it was a conversation you had or a decision you made as a leader or whatever you did uh, personally and professionally. So I ended up uh, starting from scratch and zero. And I didn't know people in real estate. And here's another thing I would advise. Never once that I keep my own database, my own CRM, client relationship management system. All my life, I used my company database. So all my hustle of finding new clients by myself or recruiting someone by myself was in this company CRM. Mm -hmm. And when you leave that organization, it gets unplugged. You wake up overnight, you got nothing on your phone. Mm -hmm. So when I started this company, I, I didn't have, I was recruiting 80 to 100 people per year for 12 years. It's one of the top recruiting offices in the U.S., and for me to know that I was interviewing 40 people a week and I had no one to call to say, I've reinvented myself, here's my company. Could have been a multimillionaire by now. So I had to start all over again from zero. And within a year, I was back to the kind of income I was making in the insurance industry prior to leaving. So what took me 15 years to do, mm -hmm. I was able to now do it again in one year. Do I work eight to 10 hour plus days a week? Yes. Mm -hmm. You can't have a million dollar dream with a minimum wage work ethic, but um, I'm happy but and I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm happy. And um, so I think I want to wrap up on this. So that, that statement that you just made is so powerful because it's the skill set that you learned in that 12 to 15 years that you just took and applied in a year to your own business, to your own business that, but it's the skill set, right? And so it's so interesting to me. I think I need to ask you this question in a way that we can end the podcast with. So, so let me ask you a question. You in a 12 to 15 year period, obviously developed a skill set that when you started your own company, you immediately applied. And within a year, you were at the income level that it had taken you years to achieve before. Why do you think that is? Um, because I didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I had already made the mistakes and I knew through trial and error, what's the best way to accomplish that goal. And I was willing to put in the time. Yes. And I was willing to tweak instead of keep doing something wrong and um, wonder why I'm not getting that result. So it boils down to being proactive versus reactive. So, um, so powerful. That's where we are today. And uh, it is honestly every day, it's the people that are a part of infused theory, mm -hmm. they're giving me, they don't know. So I'm this rock or this person they lean on, but they don't know that I'm equally leaning on every single one of them to give me the energy to do what I do every day. That without them, it would probably feel lonely. Yeah. So. Yeah, you're inspired by other people and you inspire other people. Yeah. Yeah, such a powerful thing. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. This, this was an amazing interview, and I'm really excited for people to learn from you. So thank you for thank that. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to the Moms Making Six Figures podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take a moment and leave a review on iTunes. To learn more about Moms Making Six Figures, head over to momsmakingsixfigures.com. That's right, momsmakingsixfigures.com. 